Okay, great. Milton is here. Good afternoon, Milton, and welcome. And welcome to everyone who might be tuned in today. Welcome to another session of Childlings live videos wherein we speak about different issues impacting children, particularly males, under the Blue Umbrella Day campaign. Today, we will be focused on reporting child sexual abuse and some of the factors that tends to hinder it. And we have a really great panel with us here today who have been involved in this sector for quite a number of years. So for those who might be watching but are not familiar with you, do you mind introducing yourselves? Maybe we can start with you, Hassani. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Hassan Tini. I'm the Monitoring and Evaluation Manager a child link. Thanks, Asani. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Simone Spencer, and I am the project officer for the Child Link Child Advocacy Centers in Region 5 and 6. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Milton Smith. Senior Probation and Social Services Officer um, attached to the Ministry of Human Services and Social Security Child Care and Protection Agency um, with responsibility for Regions 1 and 8. Thanks so much, guys, and thanks so much for being here today and taking the time out to share your knowledge with us. So when it comes to reporting, we know that reporting rates are pretty low when it comes to child sexual violence. Um, most of it particularly tends to come from young girls and there are a lot of factors that tends to hinder reporting from young boys. So aside from the gendered, the gender differences, you mind sharing what you have noted to be some of the reporting trends in Guyana over the years and what are possible contributors to this? It's an open question. Like anyone can go first. <laughs> All right, um, I'll go. Uh, the, the gender, uh, as you would have mentioned, when well, you said aside from, but that is, I think, one of the most notable um, aspects or, or factors we've noted in reporting trends. Uh, generally, there's um, more reports coming from uh, females than males. However, um, there are some other um, factors that um, you know we we we've observed at least us here at Child Link. Now, the reports that we get there, um, they're forwarded to us, or or they're actually referrals from the Child Care Protection Agency. And what we've noted is that uh, obviously in the more centralized regions, region four, uh, three, you get higher. Uh, a higher number of, of uh, referrals from those areas because it's more populated, obviously. But what we've noted is that there are certain uh, times in the year, certain months in the year, uh, we would get a higher number of referrals. So it, it's usually like uh, at the beginning of the year in the first quarter, uh, we find a high number of referrals coming. And it may be uh, that that can be attributed to the fact that the uh, children are at home during the Christmas holidays. So persons, abusers in the home or who, those who have access to, to children um, may uh, capitalize on the, on the time uh, that the children are home. So what, we, what we've noted is that uh, usually after, uh, whether it's the Christmas break or the uh, summer holidays, um, even to some extent, um, the Easter break, we've had um, a high number of referrals so uh, we, we uh, surmise or, or we assume that that has to do with the fact that um, the children are at home. And with girls especially, a lot of the abuse occurs um, in the home, uh, not all, but, but often it, it's in the home or it is by someone who's known to, to, to the child. So that's one of the trends that we've noted is that it's at certain points in the year, you would have a high number of referrals. When the children are usually at school, 
um, the, the numbers tend to go down. All right, um, I'm going to come in here in addition to what Asani would have mentioned. Um, he did speak about CPA um, referring most of the cases to us. Also, um, what we find, I can speak for region five and six. What we find here is that most of our cases are more for boyfriend, girlfriend um, engagements or um, sexual activities. Um, rape in itself, as was in terms of forceful rape where a child is held down and you know is raped and all of these things, we don't have a high percentage of that. It's mainly um, boyfriend girlfriend cases, um, cases where there's a closing age, um, a closing age or in between the perpetrator, the alleged perpetrator and the um, the child. Also, uh, what we find is that a lot of our reports are coming from community members. Um, parents do report, but I think that what we find is that leading the category in terms of who reports the matter for us, usually it's the, it's the community members, somebody who may have noticed a child in a particular house during school hours, or they notice that this child is sleeping over at a particular person's residence or so. So we have community members calling in and giving, um, making reports, actually. Then we have parents. And um, in some instances, you know, a child tells her friend and if the friend tells her mother or so. But um, we do have the community members who would have noticed that this child is in a house locked up or in school clothes or it's, it's school hours and this child is at a particular house or so. Ms. Thompson, um, could you please repeat the question for me a minute, please? Sure, sure, no problem. And thanks so much for that, uh, Sunny and Simone. You know, the close and age context is one that I've never really considered before. So it's interesting to learn about some of the trends related to that area. And Milton, the question was surrounding some of the reporting trends in Guyana that you might have observed over the years. All right, then. Um... Our format for reporting child sexual abuse um, or any type of abuse is via um, via um, the intake desk. And those reports can come um, via different sources. It can come via someone walking into the agency and making a, re a report, someone calling into the agency and reporting that matter, and uh, someone sending an anonymous report via our Facebook page and or a referral coming from one of our partner agencies, um, either governmental or non-governmental or faith-based. Um, so reports come via those different means um, to the agency. Um, the, 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 and some of, and, and most of the reports come via people who are anonymous and, pre, and, re, and, and prefer to remain anonymous. Um, due to the issues, great societal issues that we are currently experiencing, people feeling as though others are prying into their business, um, parents not believing their child, and so they, the child would have confided in, in uh, a community member or a neighbor or a friend at school yeah. or a teacher, and then the teacher bringing it to the attention of the agency and the agency having reasons to act. Um, some of the trends that I see um, as it relates to why probably uh, males are not reporting abuse is because of the old um, discrimination and stigma that's attached um, to the, the reporting aspect. Um, a male probably feeling as though um, if I report that somebody would have violated me, um, people will see me different. And, um, and so ends, they keep it to themselves. And so that's why we could probably account for why more um, females are reporting um, probably more than men, more than boys. And so, um, and it's, it's, it's something important that we have to address if we're going to apply, if we're going to address both our um, male and female children and try to protect them um, across Guyana. Um, the reporting trends that I'm seeing coming out of, from the region um, is that sometimes there is not, um, there is need for resources and collaboration um, to get the message where it needs to get um, to across the region 
um, different parts of Guyana where it might be difficult for maybe um, a telephone um, call to be made or a TV program to be heard or a radio program to be listened to. Um, and so you will have to find different means of getting that message there and getting the report. But the person, persons in the region, um, like the community welfare officers from the Ministry of Amerindian Affairs are um, collaborating with us and are sending reports to us so that we can see how best we can address those matters and, uh, and, and find some level of justice for the children who are affected by these type of events. Uh, just, just to add a call, um, some of the uh, trends that we've also noticed is that um, the reports come uh, in a lot of cases long after the fact, uh, meaning that long after the incidents of abuse, uh, that's, that's uh, what we would have observed in a lot of the cases. So it's not as if a child is abused um, today in most cases, and then you know we get a report tomorrow. A lot of our cases, it's uh, the, the first incident would have occurred you know, years prior so that's an, that's an interesting trend that we've um, noted. The second thing, um, COVID-19, of course, there was a lot of shutdowns in 2020. Uh, the numbers were significantly low in 2020 uh, compared to um, other years. So we've had a significant increase in cases referred to us in 2021. Of course, um, one of the reasons that could be is, uh, you know, the children, they were not at school. Uh, school was uh, closed and the CPA and NGOs like Childlink, we go into the schools, we do sensitization sessions and that's where you get some of the cases uh, coming out to you. When the children, uh, they're made aware of uh, what is sexual abuse and um, how they can report, you tend to get a lot of cases coming out when we do that. But because of the closure of schools due to COVID, um, we didn't have those opportunities, and we found that the number of reports we had in 2020 was um, low as a result. Um, indeed, Asani, and, I, and at the agency level here, we can um, we can agree with, with, with your statement. Indeed, um, the school system has become a safe haven for children, and due to COVID-19, school, school would have been closed. Um, that is where some children use as their outlet um, to seek help and seek um, psychosocial support, um, talk about their issues and get help for, for to address their issues. And the, the fact that we cannot be in every single home, um, but we can try to be in every single school. Um, if not us, there is governmental systems in place in these schools that that act on our best interests as an agency. Um, and so those were, those were shut down and those were taken away. And so indeed we have seen an increase in cases um, because as, as reports over the years would have shown that um, the, place, the place where children are to be protected are the places where they're being abused. And that is the place, that is the home. Um, and you would have highlighted that too, Asani. That is the home, and if you're locked at home um, in the place that is supposed to be protecting you, and that is the place that we're finding that is having most of the reports of child sexual abuse coming from, then it 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 would indeed um, lead to the increase of um, of child sexual abuse and other types of abuse. The other thing um, too, Asani, another trend that we're seeing is that the the people who are supposed to be believing children are the people who are, are not supporting them. Um, and, and this comes back to whereby um, the child tell their mother or they tell their father or they tell an aunt um, that is directly related to the, um, the offender and that person and, and the child is not believed and that person is, is, is given priority over the child's story. And so that is a trend that we continue to see that children are not believed um, when they express what is happening to them. And we would really like to say um, change this trend because what that does is amper the, um, the engagement with children and their close relatives. A child should feel comfortable talking about what is happening to them in their home and having somebody believe them because we're not, we not the judge, we're not the jury, we're not the executioner and taking out the executioner because we're not moving towards that, uh, that, 
that aspect of justice any longer. Um, but we are the ones who are supposed to believe children, give them that confidence that, hey, you can come and tell me when something is happen happening to you. And whether you're telling the lie or the truth, we will get down to the bottom of it and we will support you throughout this process. And I think that's what children need. And, and once, once we start seeing that happening, then we will see a gradual decrease in the amount of child sexual abuse cases that are occurring daily in our society. Yeah, definitely. The support that children need is often very lacking when it comes to child sexual abuse. And so ensuring that they have those supportive systems can definitely make a lot of difference in just increasing the rates. So, you know, you guys mentioned, you know, school often being a safe haven for a lot of children to be able to, you know, share their experiences of abuse. And so I was curious about what are some of the other other barriers, like aside from COVID and the, the decrease in reporting levels, what are some of the other barriers you can readily identify when it comes to low levels of reporting, particularly for young boys? Simone, you um, want to take it? Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, so um, in the region here, um, if I randomly give you the number 100 for any given year, 100 cases have been referred to us in a particular year. Um, of that number, um, we may have um, perhaps five of them, of, the, of those cases being boys. Or at least I could say 10, or 10 on, uh, on the 10, sorry, cases out of that 100 being um, from males. Um, I think that one of the issues that can be um, responsible for the low recording rate in terms of reporting rate, sorry, is the fact that the child may, may not be believed. You know, um, we know that in general, children, something like that happens to them, child sexual abuse, they tend to take some time to process and think, you know, should I, should I tell or not tell? Should I keep it a secret or, or let my mommy or my teacher or whoever it is know? Um, so for boys particularly, it's it's much different in the sense that with, with gender roles and all that's happening in our society, boys have a bit, it's it's a bit more um uh what's what's the word I want to use here? It's a bit more um there's more thought into the process of whether I want to report or not. So they may not be believed that one that's one of the issues for the um low reporting rate for boys is that they may not be believed this is true also for girls but it's a bit more um more to think about when it comes for boys who would have been um sexually violated um also the fact that in our society we know that let's say if we hear that there's a boy who would have been raped last night or whatever or sexually molested last week or whenever that child may be ridiculed we know the society that we live in we know the choice of words that people can use when they want to make reference to certain things and certain events that may have occurred um, in the region. We know that even parents, family members can ridicule their children, sometimes to the very lowest when it comes to them sharing that this particular person would have molested me being a boy child. So it could be that they are afraid of being ridiculed and ridiculed to the very lowest I can say. Also, there's the issue of um, being labeled as homosexual. It's possible that the child may not have even, con well, we know that child can give consent on the 16, but we know the, the society we live in, sorry, and it's, it's easy for children, for, for males to be labeled as um, homosexual. And in some societies and across the region here, we don't use the word homosexual, well, we say, um, words like is gay or um, anti-man or a body boy or a CC. So imagine you knowing that if you being a boy, knowing that if I share this with, um, let's say a cousin or an uncle or whoever, if I should, I would have been um, sexually molested by this person. Um, I know what can happen. I've seen it happen before. I've heard of persons being labeled as 
homos, um, homosexual or being gay or being an anti-man or whatever it is. We know the terms that we use in Diana. We use them very loosely. So we know those terms and that's one of one. I think that's the main factor. Um, there are others, but I think this is one of the main factors, the fact that the stigma and you know how persons are labeled in our society being deemed as gay you know there's so much that comes with it you can't walk on the road in, in peace for instance to peer off they call you names and stuff like that also there's the um factor of the child the male child being marginalized by friends you know i'm not going to associate myself with let's say kevin or whoever hit my friend's name is because we know what happened with him persons are already calling him homosexual or whatever or gay or whatever so you know i'm just going to ease them off so there's this fear that you know i'm going to lose some I, I could possibly lose some friends and i'm going to be you know seen as i don't want to send out past but seen differently because of the fact that i was sexually molested so if i can add to to that um Part of there are other, there are a number of factors actually that um, aside from the ones that Simone would have listed that contributes to um, on the reporting. Um, we have a culture in Guyana where your family name is valuable, and there are a lot of cases where parents, caregivers are aware of the abuse, but they feel as though if the the kid if 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 a report is made and the incident becomes public, then that will bring shame to the family name. And that is one of, uh, that's a key reason why a lot of, not just the child may not want to report, but the parent or, or those caregivers may place some uh, pressure on the child to have this um, incident remain private, especially in the case where it's a boy, it's for reasons that Simone would have mentioned, the stigma uh, that comes with that. So this, our value of a family name and the, the perceived fear or shame that we think that can come to the family name uh, as a result of the incident is one of the reasons why it's underreported. Um, there's also the belief that children are uh, overly resilient. You know, a lot of us as adults, we tell ourselves as a child, we went through whatever and we got over it. So now, we're telling ourselves that you know this child can get over it, so you don't need to make a big deal. Uh, wipe your eyes and and get over it. Um, so those are uh, two. Th those are two factors. Um, another factor would be the fact, and, and I'll leave some for Milton because I, I know he can add a lot to this. Uh, a lack of confidence in the system. Unfortunately, there are a lot of um, parents who believe that you know you go to court or whatever. There, not much will come out of it, and um, so that is a that, that is a hindrance, to, unfortunately, to some parents uh, to report it because they feel as though they're going to be frustrated by the by the um, by by the process by the process that has that, that has the legal process and the investigations. You know, families want things to happen right away, and investigations and these things it takes time, and a lot of folks unfortunately they are frustrated by what they perceive as the slothfulness of, 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 of the system and that might hinder them from um, reporting so I'll, I'll let um, Milton um, uh, add to this. thank you Asani and thank you uh, Ms. Spencer um, Simone um, indeed um, what you have highlighted fits into why we are having um, underreported cases of more, mainly boys being sexually abused um, which fits into the concept of labeling. Um, family um, are afraid that that label be attached to them. When I say that label, our society is not yet um, fully um, acceptance of the in, in acceptance of the LGBTQ um, plus community, um, but we're getting there, and with greater awareness, persons will will become um, cognizant of the rights of individuals. Um, however, um, persons don't won't, don't want to be labeled in in, in 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 any category, and so people, um, you know, 
seek as much as possible to not have to, to attract attention to themselves or attract attention to their families. And so they, they, they will hide the incident away. They will, they will cover it up. They will even send the child away like you would have seen happening with girls, send the child away to some family in the, in the country, right? Um, just so that more attention is drawn to the, um, the incident. Um, but what this creates is only because the child or the, or the children are not helped immediately, it opens door. It opens door for additional abuse to happen um, to that child, since that child is not would not have come to to grips of rec or received any counseling for his or herself. Um, the moral responsibility is one that we would have placed on males. Um, that you are the provider, you're the protector, uh, and you're the priest of your your household, right? So. Um, so once you once you assume those responsibility, masculinity, and and, and and you know those things are not supposed to be happening to you as a male. So if those things happen to you, you know those are not things that you go and talk to people about. You keep it quiet and you keep it to yourself and you deal with it with your, in, in yourself. But once you once you allow that to, to to be dealt with by you, it can destroy your family life. It can destroy your school life. It can destroy your entire life because you would not have dealt with that particular incident that would have occurred in your life and address it so that it will help you to move on. And this is where the concept of hurting people, hurt people comes from, because you would not have dealt with your hurt, henceforth you move on and you go and hurt others. And then there's a cycle of hurt being created in our society. So, and then we talk about the stigma and discrimination that, that society attached to, to a young man that, that might be um, that, that might have been sexually abused or might have been um, behaving um, effeminate. So all of these things are, are, are a lot of contributing factors that lead um, to boys and men um, on the reporting um, sexually abuse, sexual abuse against them. You know, a lot of all of you mentioned factors surrounding shame and expectations that are usually placed on young boys and these are really important because when it comes to the home social community environments whatever it is there's always these expectations placed on young boys about how they need to be strong how they need to you know be the man of the household and stuff like that so i'm curious about what relevance you think that religion and family image in particular might have when it comes to covering up child sexual abuse i know you guys already talked a bit about how family image and protecting that but the role of religion is one that is usually not explored so if you have thoughts in that i think that would be great um, before we go there, the other thing that I would like to address that that probably creates an issue is the old victim blaming issues too. Um, you're responsible for your own abuse, and that I think is a role. You, you that that I I think plays a role in the underreporting of um of male sexual abuse or or, or child sexual abuse, um, where uh, and then we talk about this with females too. That the the whole idea of victim blaming, you're responsible. Um, you're the male, you should have been mature enough, you should have been acting um, like a male or you should have fight back, right? You should have not allowed them to do that to you, right? And um, not understanding the pressure that what that individual was put under that would have exposed them um, to the abuse. Um, I will just deal with that one and then I will come back to the, um, the, your other question. Thanks so much for that. Definitely victim blaming can impact persons, uh, person's ability to really want to come forward with their experiences because they don't know. If I come and say I've been abused, then the reality might be my parents might not believe me, but they might say it's my fault or community members might want to know what I was doing there in the first place, you know, all these different factors. So I do think that victim blaming is a very large barrier when it comes to reporting of child sexuals violence um the question you're asking is in relation to religion and uh what was it exactly sorry 
Yeah, so Ghana is a very religious society and a lot of times you have cases of abuse within religious communities, within church places and so on. And they're usually protected under like this cloak of shame and silence. So I was curious about what do you see the relevance of religion when it comes to covering up of child sexual abuse? Okay, um, two things come to mind um, as it relates to covering up the abuse. Um, I think that the misuse of forgiveness, um, so I think that the fact that, well, I can't speak for all religions, I'm a Christian, um, but what I do know is that across the board, we, we tend to practice um, forgiveness across the, relig um, the different religions. But I think that, um, misuse of forgiveness or out of or, or using it out of context in the sense that so the family knows that my my child would have been sexually molested um like asani said there may be some issues with the justice system so we go and we share what could have happened with a pastor or a imam or a pandit or whoever an elder mature whoever it is um i think that when we um look at what we deem to be um what what we practice by reading our religious books and so if you look at forgiveness in the sense that this would have happened um i hold i hold i hold strong beliefs in my religion so i'm going to practice forgiveness um we don't report the matter we have a discussion my family i take my child to church or wherever it is I speak with my pastor or whoever it is, and we have a discussion. So I'm not going to take the matter forward. I, I believe in forgiveness. I believe that people can change. And so there's no reporting. What happens in cases like that is that that perpetrator would have gotten off touch free with the um what they would have done. And so that opens an avenue for other children in the neighborhood or in that community to, to be um violated by that person also because that person wasn't wasn't held accountable the first time around for what they would have done because we would have practiced forgiveness um and so that person just got up scotch free there and is able to go again and then perpetrate another act of sexual abuse to another child i think also um the issue of purity um with young people in church or in the community um i can say in in my region you know um there's a certain ethnic, ethnic group that holds high values to the fact that when my child get, is going to get married or i'm giving my child off to this person to get married or whoever it is as a virgin or being pure i think the the, the um the aspect of Purity um, goes a long way in the sense that I don't want my child to be deemed as um, tainted or damaged goods or so. So rather than have it reported and then it may get out into society and persons in the village or community gets to know what happened, I'm going to keep it quiet. In some cases, I've heard of um, persons in the religious group having like a meeting with the perpetrator's family um, to discuss that, you know, we're not going to pursue um, and we are expecting that on your side, you are going to cooperate with us and not have this matter um, get out into the public domain per se. So we, um, on the issue of the whole purity, there's no um, reporting there because it's going to, it's going to have a negative effect us on the family because we have an image to uphold or we want to be perceived a certain way so we're not going to report it and have this um this get out in the public domain per se um over the years um the agency would have report, re received reports um, about religious organizations um, that and, and, and things that would have 
abuse that would have happened um, in religious organizations. Um, and those were those were matters that were in the media out there. Um, things happening to boys um, in religious organizations, things happening to girls in religious organizations. Um, persons see religious leader or they put religious leaders on a, on a pedestal um, where they hold them very high and they and they listen to, to what they say and they would even um, sometimes lose their life um, for their religion and for sometimes what their religious leaders um, will say to them, um, and that that sometimes creates a, a, a really, really um, tough situations because sometimes I, I am not saying that this is the case, but I'm just using this um, in this particular so just to bring across an example. Um, but let me clear, let me be clear that I'm not saying this is what is happening, but I'm just using this as an example. If your religious leader said to you that. Um, that you should not go and tell anybody what would have happened to your son. Um, they take that as gospel and, and they take that as the, the guidance that they should take because this is coming from, from our pastor or our imam or our priest. And so we should not do this because this is what that, this person is saying and this person is getting guidance from God. And, um, and like I said, this is, this is an example that I'm using. Um, so please do not take me out of context. Um, and so we should not, we should be guided by what this person is saying and not go and say anything. And so that, that creates an environment where children are, are shut up and children are not able to say anything. But I must say that um, based on my religious um, prospect and my religious um, belief, um, abuse is not accepted in any way or any form, right? And, and no religious leader will come to me to say to me that I should accept abuse and I should say, um, I, should, I should not speak up about abuse. But the fact that sometimes that everybody don't read and everybody don't understand for themselves. Some people um, rely on the interpretation of others um, to guide them. And, and that interpretation sometimes is um, miscued. Um, to, uh, to, to, to fit the individual or what the agenda the individual is pushing. And so that, that, can, that can further lead to confusion and misunderstanding um, of the, the parent and the child um, to, to accept abuse. And so um, it is something that needs to be dealt with. It's something that requires more sensitization, requires more that the individual read a little bit more and understand fully what they believe um, so that they will have their understanding and their inspiration from, and their guidance um, from, from, from the most high himself. Um, so that, that's, my, that's my take on that. But let, let me hear what Asani has to say. And then I will I, I will see what more I will add. Okay. Um, yeah. So I think uh, it's more religion is not the problem per se, but I think it's more of a misapplication of religious principles or principles that are uh, learned in religion. Because Simone spoke about the perversion of forgiveness or using weaponizing forgiveness to. Um, to, to, to prevent persons from being held accountable. But uh, most religions, or if not all, um, has some aspect of accountability. If you do good, good will come. And if you, if you do wrong, you, you ought to be held accountable. Uh, whether it's the major religions, they, they practice that. But in the, in the instance of sexual abuse, I think, um, in, in, in a lot of different faiths, it's, 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 it's a misapplication of, 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 um, of, of, of the principles that are there. We know persons, there's a heaven and there's a hell or what different names for different, for different religions. You're going somewhere good if you do good, you're going somewhere bad if you do bad. So that shows that you're accountable for your behavior. So I think in the instance of sexual abuse or child sexual abuse, the principles are misapplied, and um, that prevents persons from being um, held um, accountable. My personal opinion, um, 
when you look at the COVID-19 situation, you would hear persons going and ask their religious leader, should I take the vaccine? My personal opinion is, if I need medical advice, I go to a medical professional, not to my pastor. If I need spiritual or uh, religious counsel, that's where I go. That's where the pastor or the or the religious leader comes in. But uh, unfortunately, we have a situation where persons are going to their religious leader for, for uh, various reasons, which might be out of the that person's um, area of expertise, right? So that and Milton alluded to that, uh, you know. So that calls again for more engagement, uh, civil society who might be more versed in some of these areas to engage with um, the uh, faith-based community so that you know, we can share our knowledge on these issues. Um, when I was not in this sector, you know, there were a lot of things that I, I, I wasn't aware of, but because I'm working in this sector, I'm more cognizant of, of, of um, the implications of, 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 of certain actions. So I think two things there, the misapplication of principles um, that causes person not to be held accountable. And I think um, persons, uh, we, we need to go to the right sources to get uh, the right information. I, I, I don't think the pastor is not all knowing or the, or the imam or, or the pandit is not all knowing. So there, there are certain things he may not be familiar with. And, I think we need to, as individuals, I think we need to go to, to the right source to get information. Uh, so, because I'm not gonna go to my religious leader if I have legal issues, you know, I go to a lawyer. If, I, if I'm sick, if, 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 I need a, you know, if I need medical attention, I go to a medical professional. So I think we as individuals, um, we have to be a bit more independent in our approach and recognize uh, where's the source of expertise for variant issues and go to those sources. And, I, and like I said, when Asani speaks, it will bring up a lot of more ideas, but the Protection of Children's Act speaks to our responsibility to report in any capacity, right? And failure to report has penalties. Right? So if, and, and parties that are named um, when, when, when a child um, reveals that he or she is abused and you are named as a party that probably said to the child, don't do anything and you are named as a party who tried to settle the matter, there are penalties for those individuals in outlined in the Protection of Children's Act that give persons in authority um, the responsibility to report abuse in every form, right? So as a pastor, and like, like Asani said, they, they, that's not, that, that, that is not your calling. Um, you're a pastor, you're a religious leader. If you need guidance, if the person need guidance on, 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 on judicial matters, then they should go to a lawyer or they go, should go to the institution that is set up by the, by the state to report those matters. And those are the guidance that we would like to see coming out from um, faith-based organizations um, and NGOs. And I know over the years, our agency would have engaged these different organizations, NGOs and FBOs, um, and engaged them and, and, and help them to understand their role. I know we would have in the past, they help them to understand their role in the protection of children um, in any form of abuse. But well, we have um, found that there are a lot of faith-based leaders who are willing to engage and who are willing to learn because, um, and I, I'm sure uh, the CPA would have had that experience where uh, faith-based leaders would have invited us to say, okay, come and, um, come and address us on these issues. So the good thing is we're making progress. I think there are a lot of uh, faith-based leaders who are willing to have that engagement uh, and they're willing to, to, to to be sensitized on, on these issues and to even act on the information that they're given. So um, we, we've, started, we've started the process, but um, there's a long way for us to go still. If I may add quickly, um, I do agree with what um, Asani said initially. Um, but what I'm gonna add is that we have seen that persons, like Asani said, persons are not so in so much into, into reading, they just go and go to church or whatever they go. If it's a 
mandir or the masjid and they listen to whatever it is that is being discussed there and then they go by those um, doctrines or those teachings, right? Um, I think that because persons have um, issues with the system in terms of, I go to the police station, persons see me walking in there, I go CPA, they see me, CPA, they see me walking, they my child, you know, they put two and two together, it, it gotta be something with this child or whatever. I can just go to church because that's somewhere where I usually go. It, it's, norm, it's normal for me to go to church. So I go to church and I speak with my um, or the temple or the man there and I speak with the person there. And so it's a bit more hush. It's a bit more hushed up there than if I go out into the public domain and I am seen going into the station, somebody there is a my community. There is a police cleaner or a worker there who lives, you know, two streets from where I'm living. So it's a bit more um, easier for me to go and talk to my religious leader who I hold as somebody in, um, you know, somebody who is so, who is so, um, who knows, yes, <laughs> sorry. Yes, someone who I believe is credible and I can trust this person that, you know, they are going to keep it confidential or they're going to advise me um, to the best that they can rather than me going out into the public, into the police station or, or CPA. And this is not for all cases, just, for, just in some instances. Yeah, certainly the factors of shame that usually surround sexual abuse does tend to keep people within these small pockets or within their community. Because as you mentioned, there, there are certain perceptions when you go to certain places to seek help. So that is understandable. But of course, as you know, as was mentioned earlier, when it comes to sexual abuse, we all have a responsibility and ensuring that we always prioritize the safety and the interest of the child is what we need to do. So speaking on, so speaking on the, the relevance of certain institutions, you know, you wouldn't go to the pastor when it comes to health issues. But I was curious, like when it comes to the reporting of child sexual abuse, a lot of times when it comes to the restrictions against it, um, people, people tend to bring up things such as, I might report this, but then nothing might happen. So how do you think like these systemic disincentives to reporting can impact the larger movement for you know, targeting child sexual violence? Um, I like your question. And it gave the opportunity for me to outline um, the procedure or the process after a report is made. Um, once a report is made to the Child Care and Protection Agency, um, it is taken into our intake department and it's documented and it's placed in our system. That report is then assigned to a caseworker. And this process can be as immediate as, as, as urgent and, and it's not, it might be seem, it might um, seem like a long process, but it, it can happen within a day. Um, it is placed within our system. It is assigned to a case, whichever that location the child is living in, there's a department there. That report is forwarded to that supervisor of that department. The, the, the supervisor assigns that case to a case worker who starts immediately to work on that case. Um, once the report reaches us, um, immediate contact needs to be made with the police so that we can let them know um, that there is a matter that requires their engagement um, because it's only the, the police can prepare the file for to send it to DPP for advice on the way forward. Um, so once that, re, once that referral is done, um, it's either the agency, um, the officer, the casework accompanies the child to the station or pave the way for the child to be accommodated at the station, even with the parent. If there's no parent present, that um, a caseworker um, accompanies the child so that, that that initial report at the station is completed. Um, once that initial report is completed, a medical is prepared or a, there's a date and an appointment um, done for the medical or it can be immediately done depending on the abuse, um, the time frame of the abuse. Um, it can be immediately done or it might an, an appointment, a short appointment is given 
um, for it to be done. And that is arranged by the police. Um, arrangement is for the maid with the CAC, which is either child link or blossom link, um, to accommodate what we call a forensic interview. Um, a forensic interview is where the child is, is questioned. And prior to me talking about a forensic interview, the child is not questioned in detail about the matter um, before we reach the forensic interview. That's the purpose of the, um, the FI, to conduct and to ask the child all the question um, that is needed um, for a proper statement to be prepared. Um, once that statement is prepared, that statement is handed over to the police with the medical, um, a file is prepared and that file is submitted to DPP. During the period of time that the report is made to the police, an arrest can be made of the perpetrator. Um, an arrest can be made of the perpetrator because the police would have information um, of who the perpetrator is, right? And so all of that needs to be prepared and sent to the director of public prosecution where they will determine what would be the way forward um, for the charges of the child. Once the child is reported to the, the, child, the, the, the child advocacy center, um, it is not only for um, an FI, but it's also for the child to receive trauma focused counseling. And I think Asani or Simone can go into details or even outline the process um, um, that is outlined for that. Um, once the child, once charges are instituted um, or advice is given by the DPP, the matter proceeds um, for the regular advice through the magistrate court or through the high court um, so that um, the person can stand accountable for his or her action. Um, the per we will know that somebody, we can, we can keep people up to 72 hours in police custody, but that can be ex uh, um, extended but it, it, it is something that needs to be done by the police. They will know what to do. And I, I would really love it if we would have had a police officer here in this discussion um, to deal specifically with this process. Um, as, as, you, as we talk a little bit more, if more comes to mind, I will, I will interject. What I can say uh, in terms of those systemic disincentives to reporting is that, um, I can, you know, there, there's a lot of frust frustration on the part of um, a lot of persons who have to engage the system. Uh, we did a, a research recently, Caring for Boys, and one, one parent in that research um, would have noted that, you know, if you go to the court or you, you go to the police, you won't get anything. So what, they, what a lot of parents opt for is uh, to get money or, or compensation um, which isn't right, of course, for, um, for the incident. However, um, what I can say is that uh, there is progress. Um, there is more collaboration between um, organizations, uh, or I should say government and NGOs. This is a prime example where we have uh, Milton from the CPA and we have um, us here in civil society uh, coming together, collaborating to, to bring education. So we're working together. We're trying to um, improve the system. Um, you know, we have court support officers now, uh, which, you know, Simone would be very, uh, of course, familiar with, who support um, someone like Simone would go to court and um, give evidence, uh, so, which, which, is a, which is a service that strengthens the system. And, and you would notice that there's more and more um, convictions, more and more persons are being held accountable. Those adults who are going through the judicial process and the investigation process and not dropping out, um, we're seeing improved results. So there's new services like the court support services. There's stronger, uh, stronger collaboration between um, government, um, especially the CPA, uh, police and um, NGOs like Child Link and, and Blossom. Um, so there is some amount of progress um, uh, and improvement within the system that is um, yielding more uh, positive, for lack of a better word, positive outcomes. Mm -hmm. So that is something that I would like the public to be uh, aware of. Um, we're, we're trying to come up with new and innovative um, services 
and we're, you know, we're trying to um, invest more, we're trying to strengthen our collaboration to improve the services that are available to families in need of, of, of justice and other interventions. All right. Um, a failure to the systematic disincentives um, against reporting. I think that what happens initially is with the families that, in some cases, when the case comes to child protection, and then the family is told that um, you got to go over to the station and then we not go, we have a medical done, and then we'll have to do an FI. And you know, they, they hear up the process. They're like, so in some cases, you've heard of parents saying, all the yeah, just can um one share or one e or you know they look for a shorter route. Sometimes when they do leave and they go to the police station and they spend maybe and half day there because officers are doing other things or whatever, then they go to the medical institution and they spend some time there and then they come back the next day. You know, it may go on for two days. In some cases, maybe three days. But some persons they tend to get tired of the running around as we say in Guyanese terms and so sometimes they're like you know I don't tired already you know I yeah, just can't just warn this person or talk to this person or go and go and tell them this or whatever it is because they, they see the process as um somewhat tedious or somewhat hectic and you know it's a lot for them financially time constraints they may be working maybe a working parent or whatever and they have to be doing all this run and run, as we say. Um, but like Asani said, things are getting better. We are having more cases going to court. Initially, we did have cases that would come back. Um, sometimes it takes um, a few months. It ranges between cases. Some may take a few months to come back. Some may take perhaps a year. Um, but things are getting better because I know back in 20, um, let's say 16, 17, that, that time frame there, you had some cases that were submitted, some FIs, the statement would have been done then, and we would have seen the cases going to the court in 2018 or 2019. But it varies because of a number of factors throughout the investigative process for the police officers. But um, that's another one there with the file going to DPP, and it may take some time. It is getting better. We do have files coming back very fast. Some files come back within a two month period and then there are others that takes longer. Um, when a child comes to the center here and we um, we have to put um, schedule them for counseling or psychosocial support, there's a number of assessment forms that we have to administer to the child. And sometimes what we find happening is that when that child has to talk, when we may ask a child about um, that's a particular question that asks um, in this entire process, what was the most um upsetting thing for you, or what was anything frustrating for you in this process? In some cases, we do have um the child say that the police station would have been the most um. Well, we know what can be associated with police, you know, they're seen as a bad place to go at. I did something wrong is the police. But um, we do have cases where children will say, you know, the interaction there, you know, a police said to me, you're lying, or you want to play a bigger man, or you want man, or something like that. So um, those are some systematic disincentives. But I think that one of the main ones is the fact that the parents sometimes, they see the process, that they, they come to, this, to the center or to the CPA, and they think it's going to be like, you know, I just come and make a report and they do the investigation and they get it done for me. But when they know that they have to go to the police, I got to go to the hospital, I got to come back to the CAC and get it in a forensic interview and all these things, they see it as a long and tedious process. But it's, it's all necessary for us to get from point A to point B and to get to the court system if we're going to have successful prosecution of these perpetrators. Um, I want to thank Asani and Miss Simone again for laying that platform, but that's one of the reasons why I outlined in the beginning, um, rather than focusing on the um, some of the issues that my address, I outlined specifically what is the process involved for a case to reach where it needs to get to. And the reason for that is to help persons, help persons to understand that that case does not depend 
on the Child Protection Agency. It does not depend on the CAC only. They are key players that are involved in the process to get the case to where it needs to get to. And we, we work collaboratively. Um, we, it, it is something that we connect immediately on. It's something that we, 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 we connect and we, we can get done. Um, because we have built that relationship over the years um, to have the process going smoothly. Um, all systems have hiccups, and it's not for me to justify why it should happen, why things are happening the way it's happening, but it's for me to say the progress that would have been made thus far to help children. But the most important part, it's not only for the system to, 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 to um, the case to reach to justice, is the support that is given to the child while this, while the while the key is, is taking the time to reach where it needs to get to, and that would be the trauma focused counseling. That would be the child protection officer getting a constant report from the from the CAC to know what progress would have been made with the child as the child developed um, coping mechanisms to help him or her deal with the, the trauma that they would have been affected by. And so all of those issues got to be put in play. What more can we do to support the family while the case is being, is the perpetrator still um, engaging, engaging the child? If the perpetrator is still engaging the child, then we need to get the police involved so that the perpetrator will understand that he can't, can't engage the child. And that is where the family and the system comes need to communicate on in this process so that the family will know where is the case right about now. So it's not the family sitting down and knowing that, hey, thinking that nothing is happening, right? But is the case working, engaging the family? Is the CAC engaging the family, reassuring them? Once we get an update, we provide an update for the family so that the family will know what is happening and it can calm their spirit a little bit and help them to know that their progress being made in the in, 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 in reaching to the state of justice, right? So yes, the child would have to go through all of those systems, and we still need to educate person that yes, these are the systems that need to be need to be applied in order for when the case reaches to where it reaches, it can be said that the right procedures were followed, and not us going back to fix those to, to address those issues, which will co for the call cause delay and, 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 and distress to the family when all of those things could, should have been addressed in the initial stage. All of those procedures should have been addressed in the initial stage. So that's why I outlined it, so that the families out there who are listening can understand. We are here, the work that we do, and the collaborative work, the collab collaborative work that we do between the CPA, between the, the, the police, between the medical officers, between um, CAC, it is it is done towards helping the child and the family come to a state of, of, of rehabilitation where they can function effectively in society, right? And amidst all that is happening. Now, um, Akola, you know, you have been involved in a lot of uh, mobilization and, and um, you mobilizing uh, even grassroots to, to address certain issues. And my firm belief is that um, in addition to us here, well, those in government and us here in civil society, I think the, the ordinary, the grassroots or the family, um, you know, individuals in, in, in the wider public have a part to play in this as well, to improve the, the, the system in that, um, you know, it, it's budget. And um, I think persons, should want to know well what is going into not just education and health but even social services um, do we have enough resources does milton need more resources um, to, to to more to do his job more efficiently um, so we uh the, the wider public needs to take a, a more vested interest um, within the system and uh create a push factor for, for improvement um, we can do what we can, but child protection is everybody's business. And if the system is to be improved, it's not just the folk at the CPA, the police, or us here in civil society, it's you out there. You have a part to play in, in this as well. You, you can advocate for and lobby for uh, uh, whatever um, improvements you see need to be, to be made. You know, you look at this, um, 
the issue with this uh, the the park in Mito. We saw how how the public mobilized around that, and um, just uh, just the same. We need to be passionate about protecting children, uh, ensure that children are safe, safe, ensure that the resources are there in place um, for, for the right services to be um, available to children and families. So I, I think apart from us in civil society and, and those folks in government, I think the wider public has a part to play. We need to take a vested interest in, in the child protection system and we need to um, advocate uh, for more so that um, those persons who are in the front line, uh, they will have the necessary resources that so that they can deliver the service to your um, liking. Thanks so much for that, Asani. Thank you for that. Thank you for that, Asani. Uh, I really, I, uh, you touch my heart when you when you when you <laughs> that. Indeed, there is need for advocacy. Um, at the grassroots level to ensure that um, sometimes we, we can come out to say what what might what are some of the loopholes in the system or what are some of the challenges um, because we're there to provide services for the general public whether we have challenges or we don't have challenges we have to smile and we have to get it done um, and so there might be a lot of hidden hidden things that might be hampering our work but uh, we still have to get it done because we're we're talking about the protection of children. We're talking about ensuring that families and all families out there and abusers don't think don't 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 worry that we don't have resources. They don't want to hear that. They just want to know that the services that they're requesting is being provided. They want to know that the taxes that they're paying are going towards the, the service delivery. And so, indeed, um, it might take it might need taking a look. And, and creating advocacy move and those things to ensure that resources are allocated where they're allocated to get the work done. Indeed, thank you for saying that, um, Asad. If That's I might just add quickly, um, Akola. Um, so Milton spoke earlier about the collaboration and indeed I wanna say that when the case comes to child protection and to the police, it's a collaborative effort because CPA can't do it alone nor can the police or the CS do it alone. It's a collaborative effort and it's not gonna be a report today and there's court tomorrow. And you know, it, it's that fast. It's a process, it's gonna take time. And I think that on the note of educating persons when they come to the sense to the, um, whether it's the center or the CSC, the police or to the child protection, that you know what, it's gonna take some time in the exercise patience we are working for the best interest of the child. We are working for the child, for the family. And so it's gonna take oh, it's gonna take some time. There's no reporting today and court tomorrow. And, and that's it. It's gonna take time. It's a coordinated effort. Like we were saying earlier, you wouldn't have the past to do legal work. So CPA can't do medical work. And so you have medical professions, they have their own challenges and whatever. So it's a coordinated effort that will take time. And persons, parents, caregivers are really gonna need to um exercise some patience in the system and let the um let us take time to get it done. We can counsel a child at least in a month. It takes time. We need to see progress. And so it's all a collaborative effort and it takes time. Thanks so much, you all, for all of those points. It's definitely given me a broader perspective of the way you know cases are really go through the process from reporting towards all those other things. And when it comes to the role community members, other grassroots organizations have to play, you're definitely right with that. You know, as Martin Carter said, we're all involved, we're all consumed. And so ensuring that everybody acknowledges the part that they have to play, particularly when it comes to issues such as this, could be very important in helping to propel us further. So definitely just looking at the ways within which you can all collaboratively continue to work together while centering the, the needs of the child is what's gonna be most impactful in the long term. So we're at our end, but if there are any final thoughts that I might not have asked, but you feel important to share, please feel free to do so. You know, the opportunity is always there for me to, to encourage the general um, public 
that there is a role for all of us to play in child protection. Um, it is everybody's business and it takes a collaborative effort for us to reach to that point where every child um, is safe in our society. Uh, a campaign that is being rolled out by our current minister, um, every child safe, right? Um, working together to keep children safe, you know, and that is, that is one of the things that we want to help persons to understand. It might be a phone call, and I've seen our ministry created uh, an app, a domestic violence app that you can, you can download on your phone and you can just stop it and you can um, report any forms of abuse. Um, and I want to encourage persons to have that app downloaded on their phones so that persons, so that you, it, it is readily available to you. When we talk about domestic violence, we talk about child abuse, we talk about um, spouse abuse, we talk about, uh, we talk about everything that is happening in the home because domestic speaks about the home, right? And so I want to encourage you to download that app and I want to encourage you to call our 914 line when you, when you hear of, of a child or you know of a child that is being abused. The CPA line is still active, 227-0979. You can call that number during the day and you can call our 914 during the night and you can report there's somebody there, whether English or Spanish, there's somebody there to respond to you and there's somebody there to take your report. And I want to reassure you that you know you can remain anonymous because it's not about you, it's about the report that you're giving to us and it's about the child that is being helped. And so that that is what and and I want to um, I want to congratulate um, um, Child Child Link and and Blossom Link, who's been key stakeholders in the in the in, in the drive with the sexual abuse um, this, this this to reduce the, the amount of sexual abuse against our children. You know the, the Child Advocacy Program is a program administered by is a program of the Ministry of Human Services and Social Security under the Child Protection Agency, but. It, it, when, when it speaks about the collaboration that is needed, because we can't do it alone. And so and for these, these groups are executing the child advocacy is the one-stop shop for us. And so it speaks about the collaborative effort that is needed to protect our children in Guyana. And I want to encourage each and every one of you to get on board and be a part of this drive and let us protect our children because our children are our future and we have to protect our future by protecting our children. Thanks so much, Milton. Hassan, right. so do you have any thoughts? Yes. Um, to add to what Milton said, um, while some persons in society still, still believe in the doctrine of I'm going to mind my own business, or it's not my business, it's not my child, I want to encourage persons who are viewing the life that if you see something, say something. We would have heard before that protection is everybody's business. So if you see something, say something. Milton would have mentioned, you don't have to mention your name. Just call, give directions and say what you would have noticed or whatever it is. Uh, it can be as anonymous as that. So don't be quiet. Don't just watch and be an observer, but take action, make a report. Let it be known that this is what you would have observed or whatever it is. And um, Child protection, the police, we take it from there. All right, investigations are conducted. Um, the family is visited um, to, to let them know that, you know, our report was made and this is what we would have heard or whatever. So there's no um, need for the caller to give their names and all of these things. Just if you see something, if you suspect something, if you know for sure it is happening, whichever one it is, you see it, you suspect it, you hear it, make a report. Okay, well, we all want uh, more, more and better teachers. We want more and better nurses and doctors. Well, uh, we should want more social workers and uh, persons in the social services field. So I would encourage members of the public to take a vested interest uh, in the child protection system. Talk to your decision makers, your, your political leaders, your regional representatives. Uh, find out what is going on and find out what you can do to help and um, take action. Thanks so much once again for taking the time out today and being with us here and sharing all these wonderful, wonderful perspectives and sharing the thoughts surrounding reporting in Guyana. And just a 
some of the systemic disadvantages you know you all face within your your own work that you do and some of the things that we need to be more conscious of when it comes to reporting child abuse so thanks once again and i hope you enjoy the rest of your day bye bye, -bye.